Okay, I'm going to talk to you now about typeface anatomy. Uh, typeface anatomy is basically commonly, commonly accepted names for parts of letters and for terminology uh, having to do with type. Uh, you need to learn this for a few basic reasons. Uh, you need to know these anatomy terms because they allow ease of discussion, they allow precise discussion, and they help you sound professional. So I'm going to give you a little story here to help illustrate why it's important. So just imagine for a moment that you broke your arm and you went to the emergency room and the doctor took x-rays and came back to, to discuss them with you and the doctor said uh, you've broken the front bone in your arm not the big one but the little thin front bone in your arm is broken I don't know about you but I would ask for a second opinion I'd be asking are you a real doctor now imagine the same scenario and the doctor instead says, says to you well you have a fracture of the ulna I trust this doctor. I assume this doctor knows what he or she is talking about. But it's not just about someone assuming that you know what you're talking about when you use the professional jargon. It's also that this doctor um, is speaking very precisely and he is eliminating, eliminating any confusion. So when this doctor says that this patient has a fracture of the ulna, all the nurses know what he's talking about, uh, the radiologist knows what he's talking about, he can write it down, and the other doctor knows exactly which bone he's talking about. Um, this is the reason why professionals use precise terminology, and this is the reason that you need to learn these typeface anatomy terms. So you're going to learn 45 terms. Uh, these are not all the type anatomy terms in use in the world. There are probably hundreds. Um, but they're the most important for you to know now. They're, it's a very good beginning vocabulary uh, of type anatomy terms. Um, <clears throat> and all of this will end in a quiz. So your quiz will cover 20 of the 45 terms. It will be 20 fill-in-the-blank questions. Uh, you have to know them all. And the only way to do this is to memorize. The best way to memorize is to write them down and check yourself. So uh, this is why I want you to fill in worksheet one as we go. Um, I want you to have a printout and fill it in by hand because that will help you remember the terms and memorize them much better than typing does. Um, so for those of you following along online, if you don't have worksheet one printed out, pause the video, print it out, and then start again uh, when you have worksheet one in front of you. Okay, before we start, I want to uh, quickly cover the diagrams that I am using for this. Uh, so there's a key on the left-hand side of the screen here, um, and whether these arrows and lines are in black and white or, or they're in color, uh, they mean the same thing. The dotted line means an alignment line. Um, this is a line that is usually invisible when you're reading, but they're they are alignment lines that are very important to the designer and the typographer. The arrow is pointing to a stroke, so it's pointing to a physical structure of the type, or uh, you might call it the positive space. Um, the circle is pointing to a space, uh, or a negative space. Um, so if we have a black type on a white background, the arrow is pointing to what is black, the circle is pointing to what is white. And then the bracket, 
uh, is pointing to an overall structure, an overall space, an overall category. Um, so I'm pointing to a larger section with the brackets. So let's go. Um, before we do, one other thing to tell you. You're going to see this word hand gloves over and over again um, in, in this uh, section and also when we get into um, type classification and you're just going to see it over and over again in your design career. So what is this word? Why, why do typographers love it so much? Um, and there's a very simple explanation. The word hand gloves, uh, whether you use it with a capital H or a lowercase h, uh, it contains many of the most distinctive letters in the alphabet. Um, there are certain letters that we look to when we're trying to figure out which specific typeface we are looking at. Um, those letters are the lowercase a, the lowercase g, uh, the lowercase v, the lowercase e, and the s, uh, either uppercase or lowercase. These are all very distinctive characters. Um, it also shows us some of it shows us all of the typical shapes that make up uh, the alphabet. Um, we have our straight strokes, we have a crossbar, we have uh, round strokes, we have rounds that transition into straights, we have angled strokes, we have curved strokes. Um, so this one ten letter word can give you a very very good picture of what the entire typeface looks like. That's why we use it so often. All right. So now we're really going to start. Um, and these first five are actually alignment lines. Now remember, these lines are usually invisible to the reader, um, but we are, <clears throat> they are very, very important to the designer and the typographer. So I've made them into dotted lines so that we can uh, be sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So I'm starting uh, near the bottom of the of the word hand gloves with this line that all the lowercase and uppercase characters rest on. Uh, this line is called the baseline and this is very very important. Basically all of our other alignment lines and measurements of a typeface are based on the baseline, either going up from the baseline or down from the baseline. Um, this is also how we align all of our letters. They all sit on the baseline. Um, so, number one, baseline. It's a fairly easy term to remember. Number two is the X height. So the X height is the height of the lowercase characters as defined by the lowercase x. Uh, some people use slightly different terms for the X height. Some people call it the midline or the mean line. Um, I want you to use X height. There's a couple of reasons. X height, I find, in my experience, is just much more commonly used. It is also a much more precise descriptive term. Um, because the X height isn't always halfway, if you call it the midline, it's actually very confusing because it's not actually usually in the middle. Uh, if you look at our example here, our X height is about 60% of the height of the capital H. It's not halfway up. It's more than halfway up. And where the X height falls depends on the design of the typeface. It is not always at halfway. In fact, it often is not at halfway. All right, so number two is the X height. Number three is the cap height, cap being short for capital. This is the height of our capital letters. And you can see that it aligns very nicely with the very top of our capital H. That should be a fairly easy one to remember. Number four is our ascender line. 
So ascenders rise above the x height. Um, if you look at the lowercase d and the lowercase l, they both have ascenders. Um, they both have strokes that are taller than the x height. Um, this is very easy to remember because they ascend, meaning that they rise, they rise above. And number five is the descender line. This, these are uh, parts of the letters that descend below the baseline, like the bottom of the lowercase g. So the descender line is as far down as, as the descenders go. Uh, also very easy to remember, it descends, it goes down. And then number six is our body height. This is the measurement from the top of the ascender line to the bottom of the descender line. Um, the body height represents the entire space that this typeface can take up. Now it is incredibly rare that any single letter would fill the entire body height, um, but all of the structures within the typeface, including capital letters, ascenders, and descenders, combine to create the body height. All right, so the body height is from the ascender line down to the descender line. It's the total height of the body of our type. Um, and this is a good time to bring up some of the metaphors that we use in typeface anatomy. And the human body is a big one. A lot of our a lot of our anatomy names come from parts of the human body. Um, we also use a lot of architectural terms, uh, uh, names that come from building design and building construction. Um, and then there's a few odd other biological terms thrown in there as well. All right, so moving on to number seven. Um, these bits here that are highlighted in black. Now whenever I'm highlighting a part of a letter, I will show you the letter in the, the entire letter in gray and then the part I'm talking about in black. Um, and these little flag-like structures coming off of the strokes of our X, uh, you can see that they're on all four sides, top and bottom, of the X, and that we also have them on the V. These are called serifs. You've probably already encountered this term. Number eight is called overshoot. You'll notice that the top and the bottom of the O uh, and the bottom of the V extend a little bit beyond their alignment lines. This is not a mistake. So if you look, if you look closely, the top of the O rises slightly above the X height. And the bottom of the O and the bottom of the V fall slightly below the baseline. This is intentional. This is a design feature of the typeface. Um, and it's an important optical correction. Uh, and I'm going to explain why type designers do this. So um, if we look at some letters, um, so basically the overshoot is there because a round character like an O or a pointed character like a V would only touch an alignment line in a very small portion. Um, in fact, a round character like an O would only touch it at one point at the top and one point at the bottom. And a, a pointed character like the V would only touch it in a very small fraction of its overall space. Uh, so extending above and below actually makes them appear to be the right height. We need to make them actually slightly bigger so that they look correct. Um, and you will find this optical correction happening over and over and over again throughout typography. It's actually a very important concept for all of you to keep in mind that often 
letters looking right is more important than them being mathematically correct or mathematically perfect. They need to be optically correct as opposed to mathematically correct. Um, and just to illustrate this on the bottom, um, I've given you the word do uh, twice. On the left, I removed the overshoot from the, the letter O. And on the right, I've left the overshoot there. So I left the original design of, of the letters alone. Um, and if you compare the two, you'll, you'll notice that the word do on the left, the O looks short. It looks smaller. It looks wrong. Um, now, believe me, I did this very carefully. The, uh, the O on the left is actually mathematically the exact same height as the O and the E. But because it's a round letter uh, or uh, an oval-shaped letter, without it needs that overshoot. And on the right, the O falls slightly below the baseline and rises slightly above the cap height. And that looks correct. That's why we do an overshoot. All right, so eight is our overshoot. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, very simple feature, but it's a very important concept for you to understand. All right, number nine. Uh, here I'm talking about the overall style of these two letters. These are both serif type. They both have serifs. And the lowercase r on the left and the lowercase r on the right are shaped very differently. Uh, they appear very different. And their serifs are shaped very differently. But they are both serif type. They're both serif type faces. Then number 10, the lowercase r on the right, doesn't have any serifs. That's sans serif type. This comes from the French. Sans means without. So it literally means without serifs. Okay, serif type on the left, sans serif on the right. This is again a concept you're probably already familiar with. Number 11, I'm, we're starting to talk about the specific kinds of serifs. So number 11, are bracketed serifs. You'll notice that there's a curved transition from the upright strokes up to the horizontal serifs. Um, I like to think of it like you're putting a shelf on the wall and you're using a curved bracket to hold that shelf up. That's a bracketed serif. It has that curved transition. Number 12, the R in the middle, are unbracketed serifs. The serifs jut right out from the strokes with no transition. It's, it's, a, it's a sharp corner. There's no curve there. So that's an unbracketed serif. If you imagine a shelf that just comes right out of the wall without any visible support, it's unbracketed. Number 13, uh, looking at the lowercase a in the top left, this is a single story A, or uh, I'll also accept a one story A. Um, the lowercase A only has one, one loop to it. This is going to be fairly easy to remember. Number 14, the A on the upper right, is a double story A, or a two story A. This is also very easy to, to imagine because you see there are two structures there. There are two counter spaces. Um, basically, number 13 is like a single story house. Number 14 is like a two story house. Number 15 is a single story G. So this sort of open G where the descender is open uh, is considered a single story G. Um, now, this one can be a little bit harder to remember because it looks like there are two levels to it. There are two levels to it. But the easy way to remember this is, is that it looks like a single story A, 
with the with the descender added to the bottom. Okay. Number 16 is a double story G or a two story G. This has two closed structures and it looks more like a pair of eyeglasses turned on its side. Um, so this is, uh, uh, this is an important distinction in the lowercase a's and the lowercase g's. Whichever style the designer used makes a very important distinction. It makes a very important difference in the appearance of the typeface. This is why we have terms for these two, these two letters for these two different styles of these two letters. Number 17. Um, number 17 is our upright structure on the left-hand side of the capital H. That's called a stem. I think this is a fairly easy one to remember. If you think of a plant or a flower, it's the stem. It's the main upright stroke. Number 18, um, this is the horizontal stroke that connects two upright stems. So the left-hand stem and the right-hand stem of the H is connected by the crossbar. A capital H has a crossbar, uh, a capital A has a crossbar. Um, that's a very, dis very uh, descriptive term. It should be fairly easy to remember. Number 19, this little round bit at the top of the A, uh, this is called a terminal. So anytime a letter ends in a built-up area, be it a, a ball or an oval, or sometimes they can be triangular or square, we call these a terminal. Um, the way I find easy to remember is I think of Grand Central Terminal here in New York City. That's a big train station. Uh, so something that's built up is the terminal. Number 20, looking at that uh, enclosed area of the lowercase a and of the lowercase d, these are called bowls. So this is the bowl of the letter. Um, and this is fairly easy to remember if you think of something holding soup. You know, it's it's an enclosed area. It's enclosing that you can fill it. You could fill it with imaginary liquid. Number twenty-one. So you'll notice here we're using the circles instead of the arrows because I'm pointing to the space inside of the letters. Um, the these interior negative spaces are called counters or counter spaces. Um, so the lowercase, the, the two-story lowercase a has two counters. Uh, the inside of the lowercase n has a counter. Uh, the inside of the bowl of the lowercase d has a counter. Almost every letter has a counter space. Uh, really, the only exceptions are um, uh, the letters I and J, since they tend to just be single straight lines or single curved lines. They don't really enclose much space. So the counter doesn't have to be entirely enclosed. It can be partially open. It is the negative space formed by the strokes of the letter. Number 22 is the ascender. It's the part of the lowercase d that rises up above the x height. Number 23 is the descender. It's the part of the lowercase y that falls down below the baseline. Um, many, many letters have ascenders and descenders. Um, basically, any lowercase letter that is not the exact width of the x height um, that has structures that rise up above, those are ascenders. Structures that fall down below are descenders. Number 24, I'm pointing to the space, the open space, on the lowercase e. So where you would enter the lower counter space 
of the E. That's an aperture. So anytime there is an open counter, the, the part that is open is the aperture. Uh, anyone who's taken photography classes will recognize this word. The aperture is the opening that allows the light into a camera. So this is the opening that allows you into the open counter space. Number 25, I'm talking about the very end stroke of the bottom of the lowercase e. We call that a finial. Um, and this is basically any stroke that kind of tapers off into uh, a little swash or a little, a little taper or a little point. We call this a finial. Um, and I find this easy to remember because it is very similar to the word final. It's the end, the end of the stroke, the end of the letter. Number 26, talking about the areas on the M and the N where uh, it curves, where it, there's a curved transition going from horizontal to, to vertical. We call these shoulders. These are easy to remember because they look kind of like human shoulders. Number 27, uh, I'm talking about a specific type of counter space. So the lower counter of the lowercase a is a closed counter. I think it's pretty obvious why it's closed. It's completely enclosed. If you imagine uh, water filling up around these letters, water could not get into the into that into that lower counter space of the A. And 28. All right, 29 is the leg. So this is the structure. <clears throat> this is the stroke coming out at an angle from the bottom of the capital R. That's the leg. Number 30, we're talking about all of the horizontal strokes on the E and the two diagonal strokes on the Y. Those are all the arms. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why isn't that bottom stroke of the E, why isn't that a leg? It's all the way down on the floor, aka the baseline. Why is that an arm and not a leg? Um, basically, it's decided by angle, not by position on the type on the on the letter. <clears throat> so, for arm, if you if you imagine a clock face or you imagine a circle, um, anything that goes from one degree down to ninety degrees. So it goes from almost vertical, but not quite, down to completely horizontal. Uh, so that would be uh, one degree down to 90 degrees, or 270 degrees up to 359 degrees. Either, uh, basically between uh, 1201 o'clock and 3 o'clock, or between um, 9 o'clock and 11.59 o'clock. Uh, those are all arms. So it's basically anything 90 degrees and above um, is an arm. Anything that is below 90 degrees is a leg. So um, on the R, it's a leg. On the E, all three of them are arms. On the capital Y, both of them are arms. On the K, you have an arm up top and a leg down below. All right, so number 31, um, this is where an angled stroke meets another angled stroke or an angled stroke meets a, uh, a stem. We call this a crotch. This is really easy to remember. It's like where our two legs meet is the crotch. Moving forward, number 32 is the apex. The top of the A or any other pointed letter is an apex. I'm illustrating it with an A this first time out uh, to help you remember it better. The top of the A is the apex. 
Another way to help you remember it is apex basically means the top, means the peak, and a capital A looks a bit like a, like a mountain if you use your imagination. So it's the apex is the top of the mountain there. Number 33 is the vertex. This is the opposite of the apex. This is the bottom point of a pointed letter. So the bottom of the V is a vertex. Also very easy to remember. A apex, V vertex. Um, many letters have apexes and vertexes. Um, and the capital W, or actually both uppercase and lowercase w's, uh, have both. They have apexes and vertexes. All right, so we have a few terms that only apply to one character. Um, 34, this applies to both the capital and the lowercase s, and this is the curved piece in the middle that transitions from the top open counter to the bottom open counter, or the top bowl to the bottom bowl. We call that the spine. So um, this is essentially the stem, except it's not straight. It's curved. So we call this the spine. Uh, this is very easy to remember because you look at it, and it looks like a curved human spine. Number 35 is the tail. This is the bottom stroke comes out of the Q and differentiates it from the O. We call this the tail of the Q. Number 36 is the I. The top closed counter of the E is called the I. Um, before I give you a little trick to remember it, I'm going to tell you why we do this. Uh, in English and in any Romance language, the lowercase e is the, the most commonly used character by far. Uh, you, need, you need way more e's to properly set a page of type than you need any other character. Um, so the look of the lowercase e is going to make a massive impact on the look of the entire typeface. Um, and one of the main ways to alter the look of a lowercase e is the shape of the upper closed counter. Uh, how large it is, whether, that, whether its crossbar is angled, any of these elements will, uh, will make a huge impact on the look of the typeface. So that's why we have such a specific word for the upper closed counter of the lowercase e. Now, to help you remember, well, first of all, it looks a little bit like an I, um, especially now that I put that circular space marker in the middle of it. It really kind of looks like a simple drawing of a, of a person's eye. Um, the other way to help you remember it is that the word I starts and ends with E. So, E has an I. I has two, I has two E's. All right, and then number 37, 38, 39, all have to do with the, two, the double story or two story lowercase g. All of these terms are specific not just to this letter, but to the double story form of this letter. Um, uh, and again, this is because it is such a distinctive letter and it has so many parts. We have some very specific terms for them. So number 37 is that little bit that connects the top bowl and the bottom bowl. We call that the link. Easy to remember, it links the two bowls. Number 38 is the little stroke that comes off the top right of the top bowl. We call this the ear. I think this 
can be fairly easy to remember if you think of something coming out of the side of someone's head. That's, that would be an ear. And number 39, the bottom bowl of the two-story lowercase g is called the loop. Um, I don't have an easy trick for remembering that, just need to remember it. All right, our last couple of terms, we're going to talk strictly about space. So number 40 is the horizontal space between letters in a word. We call this kerning. Uh, this is an incredibly important term. Um, it is both a noun and a verb, um, and it's something that designers and typographers think about all the time. We're constantly thinking about the kerning. Um, so that space between the letters of a word is the horizontal space between the letters of a word is the kerning. Number 41 is an example of tight kerning. There's very little space between these letters. In fact, some of the letters are actually touching. They're actually crashing into each other. We call that tight kerning. And then number 42, there's lots of space between these letters, probably too much space. We call this loose kerning. It's very loose. Number 43 through uh, 45, we're talking about the vertical space between lines of type. So uh, within a paragraph, within a story, within a page of text, this vertical space between the lines of type is called leading. Um, it, people often mispronounce this as leading. That's not correct. This is actually leading. Uh, it comes from the fact that when people were setting type with metal type, each letter was its own little piece of metal, and then you had strips of lead that you could place on top of them if you wanted to increase the space between these, these metal letters. So that name just stuck with us. It's leading. Number 44... You should be able to figure this out now. This is an example of tight letting. There's very, very little vertical space between the lines. And number 45 is an example of loose letting. There's lots of space between the lines. Okay. If you missed any of these, there is an answer key with Type Anatomy Worksheet 1. Uh, there's an answer key with the PDF. Um, you can use that to check your work, you can use that to quiz yourself and go back when you're preparing for the quiz. Um, basically, I want you guys to have the right answers so that you can work on memorizing them. Um, and then I want you to complete worksheet two on your own. Uh, over b between now and the next class, and we will review it during the next class. We're going to go over the answers to make sure you understand. And that's it.